right now you're going to hear from someone who is doing amazing work in a country that is just highly innovative. Chan Chao Ho, who's the government CIO of Singapore. Please welcome him to the stage. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm from Singapore. Spent 22 hours getting here since last night. So you guess what kind of shape I'm in. Now, this morning, what I'm going to do is to spend probably a few minutes talking about what is digital government for us in terms of what does it mean to us as a small nation, and later on talk about how we're using cloud in a very different way from what traditional government has been doing for a long time. So as a start, uh, where do I go? Oops, sorry, I got the wrong, wrong button. Okay, why, why do we need digital government? Many, many people have asked me this question. What is digital government in the first place? Over time, you find that citizens are getting pretty sophisticated. I mean, Singapore is a very wired society. So in the past, it's been very, very much a government-centric thing. The government thinks that they know what you want. And uh, that's, that's probably the biggest mistake in the world because it's really what the citizens want that's even more important. The second thing is that government used to think that, well, I will just supply you a whole bunch of apps and life is good. That's no more the case. It's really about what the demands of citizen is and what's relevant to the citizen. Um, many years ago, our focus was about how do we make processes a lot more uh, efficient? How do we uh, uh, re-engineer the back ends? Today, it's all about data and it's about experience. These are the two very important things that ties digital government together. Um, and we, like it or not, um, as many of the speakers before me was talking about, the government is going through a very difficult time because there is an old model, a traditional model, and there's a digital model. So this bimodality is going to be with us for quite some time to come. And web, we, we talk about web the whole time, but it's no more about the web. It's really about multi-channel. Citizens interact with us in a myriad of way, all the way from your mobile to your iPad to even physical channels still. So the ability to be able to cover the multiple channels of engagement is key for us. So what is digital government? It's really about the effective use of data and software that creates value for citizens. And there are four things that we focus a lot about. Two about experiences and two about engagement. The first one is the concept of minimizing friction. Why minimizing friction? Um, government is, has a horrible reputation for creating friction to everything that the citizens want to do. So our job is to see how we can minimize all these frictions that's unne unnecessary when anybody deals with the government, basically. The second thing about the experience is about the concept of anticipation. Um, today, we are very much a reactive uh, position. Every time somebody complains about something, we react to it. The question is that how do you use data effectively to be more anticipatory in dealing with uh, issues? And then the concept of engagement. Engagement is about creating meaningful communities that, you know, an ecosystem that works together. And it's not all about government solving problems. It's about how do you engage the citizenry in a relevant way for them to solve the problems themselves. And finally, we talk about bridging the digital divide. So let me just go through these examples. Minimizing friction. I think we have taken a pretty um, uh, important point of view about the fact that there should be no transaction if it's not necessary. Take out all these transactions. It's not about creating more e-services. It's about creating less e-services so that the citizen don't even have to touch us as a government. There's no need to. I'll give you an example. The tax filing system is probably one of the biggest challenge for most countries. And over the last couple of years, our, our view of our tax filing is that if we can get the data from the companies, if we can pull data from other parts of organization, we really don't need people to file tax if the case is simple. So today, you'll find that in Singapore, 
Out of those people eligible to pay tax, 97% file online, and 52% don't even have to file tax at all. The tax computation is done, it's sent to you, you verify, and, and we go on in life. So it's a five minute process rather than anything else. The other thing that is important, <laughs> I, I know, I, I live in the US before, so I know what it's like. <laughs> The other thing that's important, you, you, you find something quite strange, right? When, when you try to complain about a problem to government, this is probably one of the biggest chores. Who do you complain to? For example, you have a drain out there that is choked with uh, rubbish and it's creating a stench because of all the choking. So who do you complain to? Do you know? You don't. Most of the time, the government, the internal government machinery is so complicated that you have to probably make about 10 phone calls before you get to the right department. And if all else fails, you call the police. Now, that's something you don't want to do. So we created a very simple app called One Service, and it's to solve municipal problems. The app is very simple. You go to a problem, you snap it with a picture, and there's a categorization. It geolocates the thing, it geotags the thing. It sends back to us. We have a very simple business process which we route it to the right agencies, and then when it's fixed, it goes back to you and say, it's done. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. It's, it's no more about calling the police and, uh, on most of the insignificant problems. Now, anticipation. From the app itself, we created a lot of data and found that a lot of issues that were generated by the app are correlated. For example, back to the drain. If a drain is, has stagnant water, it's been there. Normally, the stagnant water creates mosquito breeding, which then creates a whole bunch of dengue outbreaks because it's a tropical country. So now what we do is that we know that's going to happen. When we fix a drain, we go out there, we fumigate the place and make sure it doesn't happen again. So this is the whole concept of anticipation. We don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Third thing, digital communities. Um, there's an app that we created uh, just three months ago that I'm, I'm personally very proud of because it's an idea that was generated over Starbucks. Literally, we, we talked about it and we did it in three months. Um, the idea is very simple. Today, when a person has a cardiac arrest, you call an ambulance. It'll take a long time for the ambulance to come because all the cities today are very congested. Traffic is horrible. So we created a co-sourcing, a, a crowdsourcing app that allows doctors, paramedics, nurses, healthcare workers to sign on. And if an event happens, because of the geolocation, we will trigger you on your phone that says, well, there's a person that's um, having a cardiac arrest there. Can you go over to help the person? And we have done that in the last couple of months. We have saved probably another eight or nine lives just because of that, right? Because it's about first responder. <laughs> so it's a simple idea. It's about meaningful engagement and creating communities like that. And if I'm here next year, I'll tell you a lot more about that because we have another five or six apps in the pipeline. And one of the last things that kind of scares us is the fact that digital is probably one of the biggest divisors of society instead of an aggregator in the sense that we think that everybody is, well, we've got a phone, we can do everything ourselves, but that's not the case. Um, the digital divide is getting wider. It's not shrinking. So we have actually very important programs that we put in place to help with the poor, the less educated, as well as the older people who find it difficult to engage digitally. And so these programs are already in place. And uh, one of our hopes is that we are able to get a bigger group of people within the community involved uh, by bridging this digital divide. And so as a summary, there are really five uh, pillars that we kind of like subscribe to. Concept of anticipatory government. How do we anticipate issues and solve them? before people even call us. The concept of virtual integration, how do we integrate our services without necessarily fixing the monster at the end, the back end, which we will talk about a bit later. Digital inclusion, very important. And I think many people have mentioned this, safety and security is hygiene factor. Without this, everything falls apart. And then finally, the concept of digital ecosystem and communities, very important for us because we can't solve all the problems and we gotta help each other out. Now, let me talk about the model in which we operate in. Bimodality is here for us to stay for a long time. 
because we're going to have a lot of whole back-end systems that are pretty archaic, just like every other country in the world. But we are also starting a digital revolution in a sense, agile, data analytics, etc. When, when I took this job um, about 18 months ago, um, there was no semblance of a digital uh, community at all. I had seven guys operating under the desk trying to do scum works. Today we have 70, and by the end of this year, we'll probably reach about 170. So that's, a, that's kind of growth that we're having in terms of the digital world. And for that to happen, we have a hybrid cloud model. We still have a managed hosting for a lot of the old traditional systems. But the concept of a government cloud and a public cloud is becoming so important to us. Um, and I was reminded, I shouldn't say um, public cloud, because it's more a commercial cloud that we're talking about. Now, the government cloud is always in important to us because there will always be highly confidential data that needs to be stored outside of the commercial cloud. But the reality is that most of the other public services can be based on the commercial cloud. It's not a difficult thing. Um, and that pie is growing significantly. Um, last year, uh, just one year ago, when we look at our budgets, we spend less than 10% on digital and cloud. This year, of our total budget, we're spending about 25%. Look at the, the big difference. And I think that kind of spending on cloud and digital is just going to keep going forward more and more as, as the years go by. So what do we do? Uh, one of the most important things we did was that we leveled the playing field by ensuring that we have a MTSC, or the multi-tier cloud standard infrastructure. And the idea is that we have a standard security uh, uh, um, tiering for all the cloud providers. And uh, AWS was the first to be certified on tier three, which is the highest tier uh, on the MTSC standard, MTCS standard. And it's now become a, a, a very important provider for us. So if you look at the example, data.gov at SG, which is the uh, government data sets that we provide to the public, is on uh, Amazon itself. Uh, we have 12,000 data sets and a myriad of other APIs going on there. So finally, so what are the implications? For a smart nation, for an equal, equally connected system, uh, the industry partnership between government and the public cloud is very important. There's, there's going to be increasing need for scalability and security. And with all this uh, consolidation of uh, cloud providers based on MT, MTCS, there will be a converging of hybrid clouds, and we'll see a very, very interesting playing field going forward. So with that, thank you very much.